This video is brought to you by Grand News. From bona fide celebrities like J.K. Rowling. From what I know about J.K. Rowling, she used to have an abusive husband, I believe, didn't she? And like for those reasons, I think she's kind of using that as an excuse to sort of project the same sort of danger that she had from her husband onto trans women. I'm Dave Chappelle. They cancel people that are more powerful than me. Cancel J.K. Rowling. My God, J.K. Rowling wrote all the Harry Potter books by herself. Man just said J.K. Rowling cancelled. Like that's supposed to mean any. Hold on. How much did J.K. Rowling make last year? I just want to know. I just want to know. How much did J.K. Rowling make last year? I wish I was cancelled, Dave. She said gender was a fact. And then the trans community got mad. They started calling her a turf. Trans people make up words to win arguments. <laughs> turf is an acronym. It stands for trans exclusionary radical feminists. This is a real thing. This is a group of women that hate transgender. They don't hate transgender women, but they look at trans women the way we blacks might look at blackface. It offends them. Like, she's doing an impression of me. You see, uh I knew the c strong with him as soon as he said blocks. I'm not surprised that he said. I'm not surprised. Dave Chappelle will often talk about the queer community and then say, well, I'm a black man. I understand marginalization. But then we'll like say some transphobic stuff and we'll say, well, I understand marginalization. I get it. But then these trans people are like they're, you know, they're they're harming and attacking this white woman. Again, this like thing we were talking about in another video about like protect the white woman sort of thing. He will defend himself by, through his blackness. And then other people will also then bring that in too and be like, well, he's a black man. How dare you criticize a black man? Uh, you're a white woman. Um, like focusing on my whiteness rather than the fact that I'm trans in order to push my knee down um, and able to talk about him it's used to stoke infighting between communities uh and create these like just disruption between communities to uh to try and sever off solidarity between them now, i shouldn't speak on this because i am not a woman nor am i a trans but as we've established i am a feminist look at him grin he's so proud to be a i won't give him a high five in the face. I digress. From that to internet icons like Vosh. Just say, bruh. Who? Wow. Oh, oh, oh. And uh, I don't see what that tender queers are. God, no. I don't take it back. I don't take it back. They are. FBI, open up. There's a legion of case studies that demonstrate a pernicious principle, a privilege, if you will. But the best introduction to this comes in the form of a Jussie Smollett. Now, if you recall, the panorama was the perfect cloak for Jussie's grand opening of the critically condemned play, The Boot Is On My Face. The very boot being the metaphorical manifestation of racism and homophobia packaged into a one-arc play armed with enough bleach to make Vibes Cartel himself blush and a noose bedizening the neck like a plantation-themed party. So whatever true diddly was art when he took this picture. Is there anything inside no. the apartment? Okay. So, so I explained to the how you were going to get something in. And, and the reason I'm called because... Okay. Okay. Do you want to take it off or anything? Yeah, I do. I just want to talk to you. <laughs> Just he clamored that he was accosted by two black men who called him homophobic slurs and popped it off with, this is mega country. The fact that this was so perfectly fulfilling the precipitous requirements for a hate crime made me dizzy. My head did bounce like ball and was swinging more than playground. Then celebrities proliferated the internet with responses of support for the empire actor Jussie, 
And if you don't remember the show Empire, it brought you classics like this. <laughs> but the very actor that played Jamal Lyon turned out to be Lyon. I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't laugh, but if you were stage a hate crime, right? Then why besmirch the couple of them instead of the men that swap their hoods for hats? Bench. <laughs> this is where we waited for Jussie to come before we attacked them. Anyway, the world dragged Jussie like a dead deer off to the side of the road. Because in an attempt to apprehend the attention Jussie believed he was entitled to, he got the type of attention nobody wants. Infamy. So what did he do in order to ward off the warranted criticism he got? He did this. Okay. I'm not. Okay. I am not. I am innocent, and I'm not. If I did this, then it means that I stuck my fist in the fears of Black Americans in this country for over 400 years, and the fears of the LGBTQ community. Your Honor, I respect you, and I respect the jury, but I did not do this, and I am not suicidal. And if anything happens to me when I go in there, I did not do it to myself, and you must all know that. Jussie Duel wielded the race card and the gay card, which in a white supremacist cishet society is somewhat of a draw for of performative people who brandish social justice warrior in their bio and bios alone. Now, you would probably say a retort that those marginalized cards didn't save Jussie from jail, nor did his lawyer, who is the current lawyer for the monospheric mogul in Sorry, Andrew Tate, not Angel, Jesus Web. But it can be argued that the very card saved O.J. Simpson. Did you do it? <laughs> no, I didn't. Nope. Did not do it. After we finished filming, O.J. said to me that uh, he had a surprise for me, and I genuinely was surprised. I think it was his idea of a joke. And this is it. In any other scenario, a black man accused of wiping out a white woman will be thrown under the jail. But OJ's blackness was only rivaled by his wealth, as well as him being the closest possible to the pinnacle of patriarchy. A star-studded athlete adored by the entire world. That trumped racist white America's voracious desire to protect white womanhood and white femininity which are pinnacles of white supremacy that if you haven't heard enough of, you could watch this video up here. But in short, white womanhood is so powerful that it can kill an Emmett Till. It can get the police called on you for simply existing while simultaneously being a badge of marginalization as white women and white femmes are subjugated in the patriarchal societies as well. Like you said, like J.K. Rowling uses her BuzzFeed feminism. That's what I like to also call it. <laughs> J.K. Rowling, Taylor Swift, like utilize that white feminism. Like they only care when the issues pertain to them, but they won't fight for other marginalized identities, which is actually like the core root of feminism. You fight for equality. Like sure, like intersectionality is a key part of feminism. And if you want to fight for equality, you should fight for it on all aspects. <laughs> God damn it. Sorry about that. Foreign from the Foreign Land Sweatshop. And you already know that I had to go and make a mention of Ellen DeGeneres, one of the prime examples of people who weaponize their white femininity and also, of course, the queerness, as well as the latest white woman of the week. We, we can make that a segment, white woman of the week. Colleen. Colleen. Hey. It's been a while since you saw my face. I haven't been doing so great, so I took a little break. So a lot of people are saying some things about me that aren't quite true. Doesn't matter if it's true, though. Just as long as it's entertaining. They don't know what to do when they're in a situation where they have to be accountable. So they don't know what accountability looks like. I think that 
Ellen and J.K. Rowling share something here, um, and it's something that I have seen. It's going to surprise no one. At this point, I think it's just it's the power of whiteness. It's existing in that proximity to all of the social things that whiteness grants you. So much power has been ceded to you as a white person throughout your entire life in all of these like small social interactions that you have, in turning on the news and seeing people like you, in turning on various TV programs and seeing people like you, in not having to actively look for people who look like you. You don't have to seek them out. They find you. You have some sense of power over the world around you. And I think that that starts to dictate how you behave in positions where you feel like you're losing power. I think that people who are used to experiencing a certain amount of social control are more likely to react with intense negativity or in ways that are really lashing out when they start to lose that social control. So I think that both J.K. Rowling and Ellen DeGeneres, I think that they're both experiencing that. Now, obviously, the word privilege in this context of marginalized folk is not the same as white privilege and the like, due to the infrastructural and historical violence that rends whatever privilege we have from our hands. But the paucity of privilege that marginalized folks have in progressive spaces is what we're discussing today. What is marginalized privilege? And how do we address it as progressives? And I got a star-studded cast of guests that are local, to the communities that are being critiqued, rather than me, the sisters of head black men, doing an inter-community criticism. But I can criticize this, my experience of weaponizing marginalization as a black man myself. Now, if you are familiar with this channel, I have called, I'm sorry, we, we need to talk about the white slander. I have called white people, skeet colored, sun dodging paper impersonating people, the list goes on. I've said things that will be read back to me in the court that decides whether I go to heaven or hell. And all that I could hope for is that my family gets a discount for my funeral because I know I ain't no way I go to heaven. And I would, I would blush if I found out that they spend so much money just for me to go to hell. Even God, even if God himself is up there smoking yeah. and getting they yeah. ate, it don't matter. But there's, there's one thing. I did. That truly demonstrates how marginalization could be weaponized. And that was my most popular video at the moment. Asiaphobia in the black community. I vividly recall my heart dropping into my yes! after I uploaded this video and I saw the sign that YouTubers fear the most. The limited monetization sign. Oh gosh. This meant that all my hard work would be for naught. So I started campaigning, claiming that YouTube is penalizing me for being a black creator, discussing these racy issues, which is definitely something that happens, but not this time. Regardless of the commentary to be had on how the algorithm treats us, we people who are darker than blue, as opposed to our colorless creator counterparts, I knew that folks will rally behind me if I cried algorithmic racism rather than the fact that my video got limited monetization because I said something that I shouldn't have. Okay, I'm sorry. I can't say I've ever weaponized the transness, but have I done that thing where I have been guilty of reinforcing white supremacy or generally just shitty attitudes and then been like, but, but like, no, I, you, you can't, you can't call me out on that because I've been through X, Y, Z. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's why I recently made a mistake. Um, I completely misspoke about the concept of female privilege. We all know, like that would be an example of me speaking about womanhood as a man and i could have been like okay but i'm trans but i didn't i became an adult when i came out i became a better person when i came out i became a real person when i came out prior to coming out i was more likely to fall back on having been oppressed as a woman than i ever have been as a trans person. Then I forgot you were ever a woman. I was just like, I was just like. <laughs> I forget too. I lived as a woman so thoroughly that I believed it myself for a long time. And the most, the most obvious example would be like the white woman tears thing, right? Like, did I ever do it in such a way that I was harming someone directly? Not that I can remember. I certainly fucking hope not. However, 
did I speak as a white person and then respond as a woman? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> the sad part is, is that it worked. The limited monetization was lifted. I paid my rent, and the video went on to be acclaimed by my critics and contemporaries. But I bit the hand that fed me to do this, to get this acclaim. And by admitting to it, I'm also robbing the next creator of color that claims the, algorithmic, the algorithm is biased against them. And because folks may doubt that now due to my admission, much like they doubt Elliot Page when they call him the new Justice Smollett without even knowing the veracity of his tears. But most of all, I robbed myself of the merit that this video had because I can never be sure if the video would have performed this well had it not been for the block boost. In this current landscape of leftist communities, we rightfully weigh the perspective of marginalized folks a bit more than our racist white, I mean racist white counterparts. And while there is discourse on whether we really listen to marginalized folks or not, rather than simply signaling that we do, there is discussion to be had on whether this affirmative action of opinion goes awry or not. I guess it's quite similar to like, uh, you know, Blair White. Um, quite an easy way to like round up support for yourself and sort of grift in a way. Like, I think a lot of right wing people like to think that they're not being transphobic while they're being transphobic. They're like, I think they like to say things like, well, I can't be transphobic because I'm listening to this trans person and agreeing with them, even though that trans person is saying really transphobic stuff. The Candace Owens as well with like, you know, black issues and it's it's like it, it seems to be quite easy to round up a lot of support because i think there's a lot of um people not wanting to label themselves as racist or transphobic or whatever users on twitter have made the running joke that people have begun using labels to justify their terrible behavior and also poke fun at how excessive labels now border on the absurd writer and nepo baby grifter lena dunham is probably one of the most chaotic, problematic celebrities America has the misfortune of giving birth to. Rather than her work, she has become infamous for her continuous white feminist antics, like <laughs> casting women of color to only play the help on her shows, and people of color as random episodic plot devices rather than people themselves. Lest we forget Sydney Anderson being the Jamaican nanny and housekeeper, or even Mo Hindi as the Roosevelt Hotel bellhop? What about Joe Yang, who played the Tibetan nanny? Or Jamel Howard, who acted as the young black guy? Literally, just a young black guy. Naturally, when confronted by her consistently so on the nose, you can smell it from here, casting choices. Lena eloquently responded that she, like, really tried this is me flipping my non-existent blonde curls. <laughs> Sorry, I can't be talking bad about white women like this. Um, really tried to be aware and bring in characters whose job it was to go hashtag white people problems. Guys, I'm gonna get canceled for that, aren't I? People will say something awful about another community that is not their own, but then will use their... their uh, a marginalized identity to then sort of protect themselves as a shield from that. I often see this with folks who only have one identity of marginalization where everything else is mainly dominant culture. So like Dave Chappelle is a black man for sure and faces a lot of shit for that. I do not want to downplay that, but he's also a man. Um, and he's also rich, right? And so like you will like pull out the bl his blackness to defend all the other horrific like classist shit that he does uh, homophobic transphobic shit that he does but he'll pull out his blackness same thing you see with jk rowling well often when she does transphobic homophobic she will say like well i'm a woman you can't you're attacking me because and this is turfs to always do this like you can't attack me because i'm a woman this is sexism you see this is this they like pull on that because i think one it allows them again to sort of remove themselves from responsibility for their actions and center their their marginalization to do so but then also i think it's also just because uh, an unconscious thing is because they see because they understand 
how, what it is to face sexism in certain respects. They sent, seem to think that all criticism of them is that thing. Because, of course, solving white people's problems on acting as a foil is definitely the job of people of color. And certainly not the job of her extremely mayonnaise characters to look internally at their own flaws and, you know, I don't know, maybe have some character development. Mind you, this the same director who onboarded Donald Glover to act, who is extremely problematic by his lonesome, he need no help, in the same show. During the very same time, she accused this character of fetishizing her whiteness. And she, she claimed that she don't see race and doesn't see him as a black man. I am not making this <laughs> up. Erasure of others' identities and experiences while simultaneously using their own as a certified get out of jail free card is a huge tactic among Lena's ilk. Her antics, of course, don't end there, though. They just keep on going. Because tell me why. This woman visited Japan and penned an orientalist piece about how she had yellow fever and described a Japanese art dealer as being gorgeous like the strong, sexy, dreadlocked Mongol encroaching tiger, hidden dragon. People of color aren't except from this phenomenon, however. As white-coded as the act of shielding oneself to join an oppressed, marginalized group may seem, the iconic Twitter account, Emo, Black Thought, disguised himself as a cis black woman for years, even going as far to tweet about her experiences while menstruating and excruciatingly talking about how painful her cramps are to her tens of thousands of followers who most likely were primarily comprised of black women. And after being unmasked, Isaiah Hickland attempted to rebrand with the assistance of platforms like Paper Magazine, which of course was to no avail. Isaiah had been masquerading as a black, dark-skinned, bisexual woman named Nicole for years. F's in the chat for black dark-skinned women named Nicole. That's not something the people who stood by and eagerly supported would quickly forget. It's not just about being queer. It's any marginalized label. Some people speculate that the Maddie-Taylor relationship was PR. But like Taylor seems exactly like the type of person to fall for a guy like Maddie Healy. She's the rapper that has Spice Girls. Inuit Spice Girls. <laughs> Just this chubby Chinese lady. <laughs> yeah, I'm rapping in music. Do they talk like that? Did anyone talk like that? They don't talk with a Chinese accent. They talk like a more Hawaiian style. Like this like, like grungy, weird, edgy dude who still thinks he's like a 13 year old edgelord. Like who's like anti-woke. Yeah, like she, I'm going to come for Taylor Swift and not because I'm a misogynist, but she seems like the type of woman who says she's an ally to the gay community specifically. And she'll go to like all the parades. She'll like say yes, queen, when she sees a drag queen, but she won't correct her homophobic boyfriend. Someone tweeted a picture of Taylor in front of like a like a plate of cookies that said Biden 2020 on it. And was like, how can she be racist? <laughs> Biden, throw him in jail, Biden. Like crime bill Biden. If you ain't, if how are you black if you don't vote for me, Biden? Like, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, it's the same about. energy as Kendall Jenner with the Pepsi. Blonde, bone straight wig, throw that shit, smudge lipstick, walking into the protest, panning to the pigs, token black and queer coded folks, product placement time, token Asian emo. Bow, I wanna be dapping me, damn the bacon hatin'. Watch me walk to him and end racism. He'll job be taking pics as I swing my hips. He takes a sip and now racism over. Jake Yaron's like, I experienced sexism. I faced sexism as a woman. You know, I probably had to fight really hard to get my books out, to get them taken seriously. And you know what? I was right because those books are amazing. They made billions of dollars, right? And so she's like, I know what sexism is uh, and I've seen it. And so when other people come to her uh, and say, this is fucked up what you're saying about trans people, she then views that as sexism because it feels the same because she doesn't like recognize the difference between the dominant culture and people in power attacking her because versus like people below her because again, she only has one 
intersection of marginalization. And so she only views it on this axis of like, I'm being attacked or not. There are a few case studies that hit close to home and near the bone because they belong to our very community. Yeah, it's time. So people over here might occasionally say, whatever. Okay, I'll take people saying re and supporting class emancipation, then I will have taken them saying re not supporting class emancipation. Yeah, I'm doing gay ops on tender queers. I'm encouraging my followers to make pick crew accounts and enter and infiltrate tender queer Twitter. So I've said this before, this is not new. This shouldn't be surprising to anyone who watches my content. I say the N word sometimes in private. Once they catch wind of the plan, they're going to all become incredibly suspicious of pit crews and they will eat each other alive. If you're a white dude, listen over here, this is the circle for white dudes who really love saying Bruh. Nick. They love saying, they're like, I'm out. Bruh. Okay, this is where they are, okay? I Does it matter which pit crew? No, just use a random one. But the more diverse, the better. Like, make it like a black butch lesbian. The cornbread tube versus white bread. Whole wheat bread. Baguette bread tube saga has been plagued with a few names, but none is incendiary as Walsh. What the devil? Y'all saw that? <laughs> Easily one of the forerunners of the debate brosphere. And listen, it's impossible to deny his indelible effect on the online left. That being said, he has employed many misogynies and tactical bigotries to make even the husk himself blush. Hello darkness, my old friend. Now there are far better breakdowns of the many transgressions that these folks have made that will be linked here. But I want to discuss very briefly how they seem to shield themselves with their marginalized status. If you create progressive content on this platform, you have had an overlapping audience with Vosh. Echo, many folks will come in your comments clamoring about when will you talk to Vosh, claiming that we have more in common than in contrast. Give him a chance. He's clipped out of context a lot. You know, all that horse and PDF file rumors, they're just rumors. L listen, <laughs> I don't care about that. You know what I care about? You know what foreign cares about? Big body foreign? I care about the racism. I care about the misogyny. You might be able to look past the bigotry, but one of the shields that are raised when criticizing Vosh is his queerness, of course. But the one I like the most is his autism. I'm a different kind of autism. Big body foreign, they say. Yes, they call me that. Big body foreign. Give him a chance. He's on the spectrum. Dust does not pick up on social cues. For one, how dare you? No, seriously, how dare you take me to be the ass that Jesus rode to Jerusalem on? And secondly, how dare you infantilize and dehumanize autistic folk them by putting them in a category impervious to criticism? But most importantly, we know this not to be the case. Because we have a whole Jesse Dom gender who is autistic. I have so many thoughts about this. The excuse being like, don't criticize this person because they can't communicate themselves as well because they're autistic. I used to work at a Boy Scout summer camp and there was a uh, gentleman who ran the rifle range and the shotgun range at our camp. There was this guy that he had issues with. And every uh, at the end of every um, day, we would do this like we would do like we'd march in formation, whatever the paramilitary Boy Scout stuff. And we'd shoot off a shotgun and this guy would shoot off the shotgun. And he, the one guy who was autistic, he would prepare the shotgun for him and one day because he was pissed off at the man he put in the wrong uh shotgun powder that was just much louder and that's dangerous when you have a weapon even if the weapon doesn't have any bullets in it and then we went and spoke to the guy the autistic guy who ran the shotgun range about this and he's like well it was autistic i didn't i didn't think it was like it was like i didn't think that it was uh a bad thing and i didn't understand i'm like no you run the you run the shotgun range you know about safety protocols i know you do because you teach it um and so to put it off on that is just using your autism as a shield to escape responsibility for your behavior if that ain't enough for you we have swalsome who is literally autistic and bisexual. Like, literally the same thing as Vosh without the edginess, which is, of course, caucus speak for racism. Vosh, him not saying it as much as his followers being like, okay, but he's autistic, he's autistic, he's autistic. It's like, you guys need to recognize what you're doing here. Like, this is not helpful to autistic people.
This is really not helpful at all. A lot of white autistic folks um, in particular will have fallen into communities on the internet that are really misogynistic, that are really like racist, that are generally just have a lot of shitty attitudes. And they may have a basis that they're operating from, from where they think like that's kind of normal behavior. I've met autistic men in particular who think that, yeah, it's totally normal to say like scuzzy things to women. That's how, that's how men joke around, right? That's how it works. Here's where it starts to get more complicated in my mind is if someone has told you that was inappropriate, I didn't like it, you now have enough information to correct the behavior. So even if you didn't have it before, now you do. Now you know. And so for me, the ableism comes into play there when people are like, oh, but they're autistic, they're autistic. You're implying that we can't make those connections, and we absolutely can. To imply that an autistic person can't have that understanding, you are using ableism to enable behavior. But let me, let me ease up off your boy voice for a second and get to the gal limb. This one right here is for the gal limb. Keffels, probably one of the newest darlings of the left, due to what I like to call the effect, which is when something tragic happens to a person in a community, a marginalized community especially, and folks begin to rally behind them in order to ward off a common enemy, which in this case, was Kiwi Fongs. And, and let me get serious. Well, let's take a moment. I can't believe I'm saying this, right? But we gotta commend Kefels. Cause she went up against a system that is the taint of 4chan. Like all of the sweat and the unctuous grease from the neck beards them of Reddit and our poll alike, it settles into Kiwi Fongs. There are forms dedicated to doxing people, threads that were literal nooses for some Sudokus. And the intrepid Keffels fought valiantly, endured some of the worst of Kiwi Farms, then emerged like a phoenix into a shiny career in leftist progressive punditing and also posturing, but we'll get to that. Then she piss on it. I talking about like old yellow style, show the leg or piss on it, right? She gone on to make some of the most egregious lies and bigotries we have seen in this space to the point where it got so bad that she had to do this. She got help. Now, let me start by saying this, right? This is an arc that we need to encourage. We ought to encourage it. When folks are battling addictions and illnesses, then they get help. We ought to commend this. That being said, getting help in itself is not atonement. And it is also not a pacifier of the pain that the, that the perpetrator inflicted. While you may be a victim of your own traumas and malignments, you cannot now claim victimhood status after inflicting pain at scale. But many supporters of Keffels warded off criticism in the name of her rehab visit. And whether she is doing it intentionally or not, Keffels is not only using her status as a trans woman, a trans woman that was attacked by one of the most vicious platforms on the internet, but also her status as a survivor of substance abuse. And she primped and preened the slithering coils of Medusa. So I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm still like working through with like a therapist and psychiatrist to like work through certain things. But I would say as someone who has struggled with mental health for most of her life, I one of my biggest pet peeves is when people use that as an excuse to justify behavior. I grew up with a lot of people around that. Um, like, like I remember I was in this like theater group ones and like one of my friends at the time was like really mean to this other girl and she was like I just have anxiety today there was definitely a point where like especially during the pandemic my mental health was affecting the my parents like the people I live with because at a certain point I was in like a heavy depressive episode and like I was just like I essentially had a meltdown and like my parents were going to take me to a hospital to like try to like sort that out that's what really like that was like the moment for me where I was like I need 
to be on medication in a general sense, because treatment looks different for everyone. It just prevents incidents like that from happening in the future. Or like if some similar feelings like that pop up, you know how to handle it. But that doesn't justify or, you know, wash, you know, wash you of any consequences because you're preventing that going forward. Like you still have to take accountability for how you acted in the moment, even if it was out of your control. Like there's like this saying that I really love that like your trauma is not your fault, but it is your responsibility. White women in particular have been known for, and rightfully so, for their loyalty to whiteness above femininity when it serves them, only to return to the label of womanhood when it's time to don those I'm with her pins. With just pearly things as well, I think she's, the way that she's like directly contradicting the things that she says by having a YouTube channel and by having her own career and not marrying herself off and having children, I mean, that, that fact in itself just kind of proves that it's quite an easy grift you know you don't you don't even have to live the values that you're putting out there like they don't they don't care like as as long as you're a woman who's agreeing with them they don't care so with our videos you can kind of tell like we we put a lot of time into them we we consider the things we're going to say and you know it's it's a well sort of rounded video whereas if you look at just pearly things as content it's it's terrible. She just sits in front of a camera and she just talks crap. And sometimes she won't even edit out when she's just sat there like scrolling through her phone. You should just sit there for a minute like. While women of color, mostly black women and femmes as always, tirelessly labor to uplift their community's social position. Getting back to Lena Dunham, once again, proving herself to be one of the worst people of 2013, tweeted, that she'd be the first openly straight woman to French kiss the first openly gay NBA player. Anyway, and again, keep in mind that this is the same white woman who harassed Odell Beckham because he refused to engage with someone so absolutely deranged. Well, let's start talking about language, its many forms, its meanings, and its evolution. A Canadian paper, the Toronto Star, once found itself in some internet drama over the concept of race and the verbiage they used. The Ontario Human Rights Commission had settled on a term in use to the reference of people of color, racialized people. Because they accepted that race is a social construct, they decided to use the phrase racialized person or racialized group instead of labels that they said were outdated, like racial minority, visible minority, people of color, and non-white. And so, in the feeble-minded attempt at being the onion, a reporter at the Toronto Star headlined five other labels for people of color, or non-whites, or racialized people, I mean, surely the commission focused on human rights was being sensitive, just like the Gen Z weirdos. Always being such crybabies and snowflakes, right? Well, readers naturally complained to the news outlet about her tasteless remarks. People hated that she was making fun of it. Well, less she thought that the labels themselves were funny, but the idea that creating new terms that were more inclusive is an exhausting silly process that seems reductive. After so much backlash, the story she wrote was removed from the website on the same day with a community note that the piece did not meet the company's standards. Coincidentally, at the same time, the United States Army was critiqued for not being an imperialist force that assisted in the global domination of the crumbling American empire but for updating its code of conduct and regulations on preventing discrimination by saying that people who identified as African-American or Black may also identify as a Negro. Personally, the term Negro exudes the I had a dream and well golly gee, better go grab me a soda pop after going to such a great party era. But you know, I digress. The story was widely reported. People were shocked. The U.S. Army? Negroes? 
The policy hoped to provide fair treatment for military personnel and family members without any regard to race, gender identity, religious beliefs, or nationality by proposing to provide an environment free of unlawful discrimination and offensive behavior. It then lists and defines the racial and ethnic group it aims to protect, with the word Negro being the one synonym in a long list of various ways those who fit into the term black may choose to identify. Regardless, they felt the need to publish an apology and recall the verbiage. So here we are in 2023. We've got minorities, non-whites, and people of color. Many of us hear the term diverse being thrown around to encompass organizations, coalitions, or corporate employees' racial makeup. As in, we're so excited to have a diverse voice speaking on this particular issue. But these are terms that have really come to the forefront of discourse and usage only recently. Only to be replaced with never <laughs> hipper alternatives. Yes, words mean things. But words have and will continue to be replaced with less offensive or less loaded identifiers than their predecessors, which is a process known to linguists as prejuration. If a word that refers to something always appear in sentences where that thing is framed negatively, then that term will take on that negativity. Harvard psychology professor similarly opined in his book, The Blank Slate, that the euphemism treadmill is a recent drive to adopt the new terms for disadvantaged groups, and it often assumes that the words and attitudes are so inseparable that one can re-engineer people's attitudes by tinkering with the words. People invent new words for emotionally charged reference, but soon the euphemism becomes tainted by association, and a new word must be found, which soon acquires its own connotations, and so on. Even the word minority, the most neutral word label conceivable, referring only to relative numbers, was banned in 2001 by San Diego City Council because it was deemed disparaging to non-whites. The euphemism treadmill shows that concepts, not words, are primary in people's minds. Give a concept a new name, the concept does not become freshened by the new name, at least not for long. Names for minorities will continue to change as long as people have negative attitudes towards them. We will know that they have achieved mutual respect when the names stay put. Labels we use become moot with our ever-evolving socioeconomic, social, and racial awareness, which is why some may find things like non-whites to be offensive, because it makes white people the default and classifies people of color as, once again, the other, or deviation from the perfect norm. On the other hand, some people may consider minority to be offensive, as it implies that people of color, or the LGBTQIA community, or women are a shrinking group when we're anything but. The term oriental has thankfully become Asian, which is now Asian and Pacific Islander. Colored transitioned to Negro, which transitioned into Black and African American. If you're from the land of bald eagles and hellish urban suburbia, but white people, that's something that's remained constant, with only those who fit in it qualifying as white being changed. But that's normal. And depending on where you're from, those meanings will change. Colored is a terribly outdated label in the USA, but still very applicable in South Africa. As Professor Hall Lu adeptly contextualized, the term people of color and colored have drastic meanings depending on who says it, what they're speaking on, and why they said it. Which brings us back to marginalized privileged. Tings mean tings. Words have power. By using that label, people can wield power over anyone they're debating. I mean, after all, how can they be wrong, right? Don't you see that they're a queer person? They know what the hell they talking about. 
and can therefore be excused when they say something incredibly racist or transphobic. We also don't forget that, that the people behind those platforms are human beings who will fuck up and make mistakes. Um, sometimes, sometimes very egregiously they need to be super held accountable for, but also sometimes in, in smaller ways. Not, I don't want to say benign ways, but smaller ways. And what we will do to marginalize people is we will hold them even more accountable and extrapolate the harm, even like hyperbolicize the harm. Uh, in order to be more quick to tear them down in ways that cis dude creators will, will n cis white dude creators will not uh, have to uh, deal with as much. You know, they'll say something awful and they'll be given a little bit more forgiveness than a marginalized creator who will often will have more hyperbolicized harm. And so it's one of those, it's one of those things like, I don't think anyone's owed a platform. I think everyone on a platform should be held accountable for if they fuck up. And it's not just like you, you should be allowed to continue to have it. But we also at the same time need to recognize that the standards that we hold for marginalized creators is much higher. And we are much more willing to tear down their platforms than we are for non-marginalized creators. It's the fact that we don't, we don't, we don't have the space to fuck up. We don't have the space to be shitty, selfish people who tell lies. We're not allowed. We're just we can't. And that's frustrating. And I feel like we won't have like equality isn't going to be a thing until marginalized people are allowed to also be shitty. But back to labels for a minute. The reason labels continue to fluctuate is because of the ever evolving positions of those being referred to. In many cases, those in the affected groups prefer to label themselves, which is a process called creating an autonym. As they become more socially visible, naturally, Terms can also be debated within a group. Like if an American black person should use black or African American. The groups we choose to identify with and their associated identifiers also provide credibility and open the gates of access to that community. If you're black, you can reclaim the N word. And if you're queer, you can reclaim the F slur. And if you're black and queer, well, you understand what I'm saying, right? Depending upon the context, reclaim slurs are terms of endearment or used to poke fun at themselves, while in other cases not used by those within that group, they're absolutely derogatory. What makes someone marginalized to fit into the identified group is what sociology calls being in the out-group. Those not in the in-group, which is whiteness, in the case of Western racial identity, which white people made, are othered and pushed to the fringes of society where they're treated as lesser than or as a means of economic and social fodder. And of course, being marginalized doesn't exempt anyone from having biases, whether internalized against their own group or externalized through tangible actions upon others. You know, and I get it. We all have flaws. It's totally natural to get defensive. But the use of a shield damage our ability to progress as empathetic human beings in collaborations, community organizations, activism, and on our own personal journeys. Shields create rifts where there should be solidarity. We need to encourage dialogue, self-reflection, and less virtue signaling anger for the tiniest of details. Semantics are famous tactics used by those on the far right and center to antagonize the left. Making virtual identities that seem legitimate to derail progressive discourse. Because they know that people are huge on identity politics and labels. And it's something that people have been calling other leftists out for doing online as well. So, while we hold ourselves and each other accountable, we should understand how marginalized identities have historically interacted and how people are unique and multifaceted which sometimes means taking a step back. Not every marginalized person in their community is fit to represent their entire group or speak on its behalf because people aren't monoliths and people shouldn't use their labels as a means of deflection. After all, a platform is not a right, it's a privilege and it comes with a responsibility that not everybody can handle. And you know what else people can't handle? The truth which, as a political scientist, is of the utmost important to me. So I'm gonna let you in on a little secret I learned in my master's program. Finding factual journalism is difficult, 
Due to the sensationalization of the sources, political scientists would swear by the New York Times or BBC, pause, for unbiased news. But even they have compromised their reputation by reporting partial perspectives. Thankfully, Ground News is here to help. I personally trust and use Ground News every day because it scores breaking news stories by ownership, factuality, and bias. What I love about Ground News is how non-American centric it is because it gives you perspectives from across the globe or even local news perspectives rather than getting the Americanized version of everything. And with my link, ground.news slash foreign man, you get a tool to break you out of your echo chamber while supporting your favorite independent, marginalized, and melanated creator. More, I'm, I'm talking about me. And for a limited time only, Grand News is offering a 30% discount for their Vanta subscription to all foreigners. You can only redeem this discount at ground.news slash foreign man. So be sure to click on the link below and check out some more videos.